Squats are beneficial because they work many of the large muscle groups of the legs and provide the ability to increase one's strength, power, and endurance. In the past, we at the Cybex Research Institute have analyzed how differences in squat instruction can change the biomechanics of the exercise, but more often we get questions related to form or technique. Specifically, how wide should the stance width be during the squat exercise? Are there any benefits to performing the exercise with a wide stance, sometimes called a plie squat? Typically, the bodyweight squat exercise is initiated with the exerciser's feet at approximately shoulder width apart. If one were to take a wider stance, what differences can they expect during the exercise? Let's take a closer look at the normal stance and wide stance squat, then attempt to determine when we might utilize either of these variations in a fitness program. This plot demonstrates the differences in hip extensor torque for one repetition of a normal squat in blue and a plie squat in red. The similarities in peak values of these curves, a difference of only about 10%, suggests that there is likely not a major difference in how the hip extensors are activated during either of these variations. The same could be said regarding this plot for the knee extensors. Therefore, we can be reasonably confident that the exercise effect on the hip and knee extensors will be similar between the variations. Where we do see a difference, however, is when we shift our analysis from the sagittal plane to the frontal plane. For example, we can see here that peak AD ductor torque at the hip is much greater when the exerciser assumes a wider stance. This suggests that a wider stance is more demanding than the normal stance to the muscles of the inner thigh. This is consistent with past research demonstrating greater levels of electrical activity of the hip AD ductors as a result of the wide stance. We see a similar trend at the knee although the differences are probably not clinically meaningful to healthy exercisers. This was the conclusion of a recent research study with similar findings. Since there are no true AD ductors at the knee, the onus is primarily falling on the medial support structures, such as the MCL. If someone has compromised lateral strength, perhaps due to a strain or tear of this ligament, then a wider stance might not be advised. One final difference we see at the hip is in the transverse plane, where internal and external rotation occur. As we can see, the wider stance results in more than twice the activity of the external rotators at the hip. While this is an effective way to target these muscles, one should be aware of any weaknesses to this muscle group as a potential limitation to the completion of the exercise. In addition, inflammation of the piriformis, one of the primary external rotator muscles of the hip, can lead to piriformis syndrome. This is often called wallet sciatica, a condition in which the sciatic nerve becomes impinged and can result in pain and discomfort in the lower back and leg. If someone experiences these symptoms, they may be able to relieve this pain by narrowing their stance, reducing the demand to this muscle group. By selectively determining stance width, we could potentially reduce pain, change the range of motion, or increase demand to the muscle groups that we desire. Considering these types of analyses, will help guide us in our own exercise choices or the prescription of exercises to others.